Are you ready, kids? Hello, it's Employee Amelian, and welcome back to SpongeComs. Today's episode is Season 3, Episode 4, or Episode 44 overall, Nasty Patty and Idiot Box, both of which originally premiered on Nickelodeon on March 1st, 2002. We're officially fully in 2002 for a while now, ladies and folks. So, yeah, kind of weird that we're starting off this larger 2002 run with Nasty Patty. It's a pretty good episode, but it's just kind of weird when they decided to air it March 1st, first day of spring. Death! Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, it's it, it wouldn't be sponge combs if I wasn't ragging on the Nickelodeon schedule, people. This episode was written by Paul Tibbet, Kaz, and Mark O'Hare, and I believe this is the very first episode which Kaz worked on. Very famous underground animator with a very surreal comic art style. Joined Spongebob on season three, then left for a while to work on Camp Laszlo and Phineas and Ferb, among other shows, and then came back to Spongebob, and his episodes now are more surreal than ever before, and he's become a bit more contentious since he came back to Spongebob, but I still like his work. I still think that he puts a lot of effort into making his jokes in these shows as memorable as they can. And of course, he knocks it out of the park constantly in season three of Spongebob. And this is a good episode to start with. One thing that always strikes you about Nasty Patty is that it starts off so normal, despite the joke at the beginning with the narrator going, it was a dark and stormy night that made me remember a bright and sunny day. That's a good joke. But besides that, this episode is known for being a lot more macabre as it goes on. And, I mean, that makes it very unique in terms of pre-movie Spongebob. They've always been doing horror stuff, but this feels like the first episode where they were really tripling down on this really gross and disturbing idea and this gross and disturbing imagery for a whole episode. Well, for most of a whole episode, if that makes any sense. Like, I feel like it's been noted that whenever a fan confronts one of the later writers about why is the show so dark and disturbing now, they'll point to an episode like this to say that this is, this has always been somewhat of a recurring theme in Spongebob since at least before the movie. And that's another thing. This episode, in terms of tone, can often remind me of the first Spongebob movie in terms of how gritty it is. This is not at all negative stuff. If anything, it just makes this episode stick out a lot more in a positive way. It's one of the uh, sort of creative outlets. They just allowed themselves to do something outside of the usual Spongebob comfort zone, and it had a pretty positive reaction. I mean, I don't see any people really disliking this episode. It's not one of the least liked episodes of the season. But there are some things about it that make me kind of do a double take, like, what? But at the same time, it is still a very funny episode. It still keeps you on the edge of your seat. And yeah. That is one nasty looking patty. It's even nastier than the one with an eyeball in it earlier this season and the alley's you was always greener. The al the al jeans always greener. I don't know. So yeah, here we go with more of a morbid edge, Spongebob and Mr. Krabs thinking that they have murdered someone. I know, wacky misunderstanding, that always drives me up a wall, but they do totally deserve it for trying to do something so messed up to someone they didn't even really know was a health inspector for a while. Again, very fun little misunderstanding here. I love how the image of the fake health inspector, it's just a stereotypical burglar. It just makes the 
real health inspector, all the more legitimate, and this whole misunderstanding all the more ironic. So with how the story progresses and how the characters behave, I think it is good at showing how different SpongeBob and Mr. Krabs are in their world consciousness and how long they've been alive, how much they've seen in their lifetime. Because SpongeBob is just a kid in this situation. He's he hasn't spent as much time in the war or the navy or anything yet. He's still learning how to cope with something like death or murder and it it's really messing him up. It's really scarring him. Like there's this scene later on where he's dragging the limp unconscious body of the health inspector. Here it is. And yeah, this really proves that this is something that only SpongeBob could pull off. At least on Nickelodeon side of things. Because you could never see like Angelica or Timmy Turner or Eliza Thornberry doing this. You just couldn't. This is only something SpongeBob really could have done. Especially even especially at this point, even in this sort of post nineties but not super like ethically conscious 2000s, 2010s, 2020s yet. Like, even the edgiest Nicktoons, like, this would already even be kind of weird on Ren and Stimpy, but with Spongebob, it's just a whole other thing altogether. It's just kind of messed up, and that is the appeal there. That is the hook to the episode. But what really gets me about this episode as I get older is just seeing this edgy situation, not just with Spongebob, but with Mr. Krabs, like, he knows exactly what he wants to do in this situation, and that raises questions. Like, has Mr. Krabs got a record of doing this sort of thing with people he doesn't like? Like, obviously, Mr. Krabs does get more... He's less of a role model, of a hero figure, as the show progresses, to the point where even, even Plankton sometimes is the more of the hero in these stories. And I feel like this is definitely a detour for Mr. Krabs, just really letting him have this sort of edgy, not exactly villainous, but anti-hero kind of role. And of course, one thing that I do absolutely think really sells this episode is how washed out the colours are in the second half of this episode. Like, it's, it, it did start out on Bright and Sunny Day, like narrator said. But then the rest of it, especially from this point onward, is just very dull, very green and grey, and yeah, it's just... It's not exactly what you'd call a lovely, light-hearted Spongebob tone to all of this. And I especially think that the rolling ball CG that they always did around this time looks a lot spookier and uncanny when they've got this dark look and this fog. It's almost Courage-esque in a way, this sort of background. And they, there was always this disconnect between like, the outside and inside of car scenes back in the day, even in live-action shows, and that just really added some unease to this take on the scene in particular. I also really like that they added cops to this. Like, they're a very tense wrinkle to add to this sort of story. And I think that they are fairly well characterized. They are, they do appear to want to keep Bikini Bottom safe to a reasonable extent. And they do have sort of some serious problems internally with the ethics that just kind of come out and make them a bit more interesting as cop characters. 
like it's always fine when cops aren't totally like you know authority figures it's it's all right to have them not be authority figures albeit still comedic and light-hearted in a sense as you'll see they do not know how to handle zombies and a funny thing about this part of the episode especially when Mr. Krabs is celebrating no cash register night there is an unused shot of the cash register that's just a painting but in the actual episode it's all done with digital prop animation that is kind of weird I mean I think it looks better with the prop animation it's less jarring because in general I think that this episode has much bolder line art than usual for this period. Like, what am I watching? Cartoon Network? <laughs> but yeah, the line art is pretty, like, big and striking in this episode, which I don't really know if that was a creative choice or just an oversight from whoever the animation director was, but yeah, it works in the episode's favor. How do I feel about the health inspector still being alive? I am super thankful that SpongeBob and Mr. Krabs are not canonically murderers, even at this point. And I am pretty happy with how they handle the jokes of him constantly getting beaten up. I do think it's a bit overdone, but I'm not a SpongeBob writer. I don't know exactly how far would have been too far to these people with these stories, but try as I might, you know? All I can say is that is one unprofessional looking health inspection paper, but yeah, fun episode. Interesting new kind of episode, something that they will try to do more often to mixed results, but Nasty Patty will always stick out as a particular detour in season three. Idiot Box was written by Paul Tibbet, Kent Osborne, and Meriwether Williams, and by 2009, it was Tom Kenny's fifth favorite episode of the series, if his Tom 20 iTunes and Amazon playlist was anything to go by. And yeah, I can totally see why it's on this list. Ironically, in the blurb for it, he says that the crux of the story is that Squidward doesn't have an imagination. That's why the story goes the way it does. But when you watch it, I think that the idea is the complete opposite, that he has an overactive imagination. But yeah, you can make your own interpretation out of any SpongeBob episode. It's totally fine. Dom has his own. I have my own. And I've already talked about this episode a couple times, not just in my old SpongeBuddy Mania review series, but also on this channel. This was the subject of the very first showdown I ever did. I pitted this against the paper. The paper won, but this is still a pretty good episode, all things considered. And I also talked about it when I reviewed the Tom 20 a year ago. And yeah, there's a reason it keeps coming into my mind and into my field of review subjects because it does have one of the most iconic little bits in SpongeBob history. It's more of a running gag in this episode, but this little bit where SpongeBob just makes a rainbow with his hands while showing what imagination's all about, that is probably the most iconic imagery from the show, period. Like, you've got your sweet victory, you've got your Krusty Krab pizza wrap, you've got your bubble buddies, your training videos, your wet painters, you've got all of that. But I think that when Spongebob comes to mind to a normie, Spongebob making a rainbow out of his hands is probably the first image that they think of. And I'm really happy that it comes from a great episode and one of the most laid-back episodes. It's not really a super taxing or super deep or emotional episode. It's just a fun little examination of imagination and what it means to have it as a kid, 
because SpongeBob and Patrick are pretty much kids in this episode, and as an older man like Squidward is portrayed in this episode. One thing that I do kind of have against this episode on a visual level is that you kind of spend too much time around here at the start of the episode just looking at the box and hearing Spongebob and Patrick. I mean, it's good to see that this is the last time for a while that Spongebob does his old newspaper reel voice that he's been doing since Help Wanted and Mermaid Man 2 and stuff. Like, that comes into play with this sort of playtime that he and Patrick go through. In general, I am kind of torn on whether Patrick really adds anything to this episode, because on one hand, he doesn't exactly. The story, the general trajectory of the episode can go about the same highway with Squidward just fussing over Spongebob. But with Patrick in the mix, he does deliver some pretty good jokes. After all, he does have those glasses, those live-action glass glasses at the start of the episode. That's really good. And he always adds his little accent to the episode, just sort of offering up how much he loves boxes and how much he loves playing with them with Spongebob. And yeah. I do feel like he is at least a positive and humorous addition to this episode. And of course, this is just about as good as Squidward can get in terms of showing that he has just as, if not more, of a sense of childhood than Spongebob on occasion, because... I don't know exactly how much of this is Spongebob and Patrick just being really good vocal sound effect performers when Squidward isn't with them, of course, or how much of this is just Squidward not really understanding that, just not understanding something about how seeing isn't believing or something along those lines. Oh, and here we've got some nice foreshadowing of the camping episode. I, I guarantee you that the Spongebob writers for the rest of season three, for the rest of the pre-movie era, were sitting around, scratching their heads, wondering, what can we do with that sombrero? When is that going to come into the picture again? And then they got their camping episode. They got their sea bear. And then they thought, yes, that's it. We know exactly what to do with that sombrero. I wouldn't put it past them. Sorry for the speculation. So this episode's kind of interesting in that regard too, is that it also has foreshadowing and it's also harkening back to the paper from season one. No wonder this is a comparatively chill episode because, well... It is kind of a sequel to the paper, a season one episode. One thing I do love about this episode also is the title, because Idiot Box was an old-timey slang term for television. And another thing that I do really think puts this episode in sort of a time of its own is the fact that the TV is massive... Like, we've got massive TVs today, but they're usually flat-screen TVs. They aren't, like, these big, bulky, box-like TVs. And TVs weren't that massive in the 20th century, for most of the 20th century, because they would usually just be small and mechanical and have, like, anywhere between 2 and 20-inch screens. This episode could have only really been made around the turn of the millennium when boxes, especially TV boxes, were big enough to be played in by people. Well, this brings me into the question of the week, which I will rattle off later. Speaking of how big this box is, who else thinks it's a TARDIS? I mean, it's bigger on the inside. <laughs> Now, 
Now, Nasty Patty is kind of a weird episode to air on the first day of spring in terms of seasons. This episode, I think, was a better fit for the first day of spring because, you know, the weather's getting warmer, more flowers are coming out, more trees are blooming, more you don't need to wear as much heavy clothing. So it's the start of a sort of playtime season for children and this episode all about not really needing TV for personal entertainment and stimulation was kind of a positive thing to air around this time. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that obsessive over the air dates. This episode is funny at any time of the year. That's why I'm seeing it in October of all times. But it's also like, you've got, you've got a really good episode to show children that Spongebob is sort of teaching children that they don't need a TV. They can just play and think up their own stories. They don't need to require, require Gift of the Magi performances on TV or boxing matches between boxes. You know why I post that on the Spongebob quote of the day Twitter account every boxing day, don't you? <laughs> and of course, this ending is a nice little way to round out the episode. It also kind of shows just how maddening the surreal situations were across the episode. You've got mountain climbing, you had spaceships, you had bombs, and then you got Robot Pirate Island, which Squidward himself made up, and then SpongeBob and Patrick rolled with it. And of course, the box keeps changing size and shape, but, you know, it's for dramatic tension, I can buy that. And then we're going to the dump, to the dump, to the dump, dump, dump with Squidward. And, you know, it's kind of throwing him a bone here. Just letting him think that the box is just doing its thing. Which is a lot more than most other Squidward episodes, even at this point, did. Just let him be happy for a bit. But then you see garbage and the word garbage... And I, this line by Spongebob here always mystifies me. Like, is he talking about how he and Patrick made the box work in some sort of strange way that made those sounds? Or is he talking about, from Squidward's point of view, what made the box work for Squidward? Like with whether or not Squidward has imagination in this episode, I think this is a sort of a, you can do, you can go either way, you can make your own interpretation and also, I'm happy that this is the first time Squidward got a pie in his face without exploding. Glad he's got that horrible allergy over with. So that was Nasty Patty and Idiot Box. My question of the week for you last week, or two weeks ago, was what was your opinion on Season 3's take on boating schools? And I saw there was a pretty cool reception to them, and I can kind of get why because it wasn't really tackled with again on a consistent basis. But I see some of you like a couple of them, which is fine. But my question of the week for you this week was, did you play in boxes or bubble wrap? This is probably going to be the most childish question of the week that I ever give you, but I never cared about boxes. I only cared about bubble wrap. And I hope some of you did too. Next time, in January, when Sponge Combs comes back for 2022, starting to get back into actual episode anniversaries, we're going to be taking a look at an episode set about unfair confinement. Confinement to a pickle jar in Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy 4, and confinement to a prison in doing time. Goodbye for now.